And you also make quite a lot about sleep. Yeah. You feel that there's, I mean, and but you also mentioned rather practical steps that people should take, which I phoned my children this morning and said, right, <clears throat> here's the things you've got to do. You can't have your mobile phone by your bedside. <laughs> Tell yeah. us about that, because I've just told all my children. So okay, I need great. some backup because they won't have it. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's back that up. And then I want to circle back also to diet because we just touched on it briefly and there's a lot to be said there. Um, so I think that with the phone, I really like the message of use your phone. Don't let it use you. Someone said it really well lately, the way the mind is a, a really good servant and a terrible master. I think the same can be said of the phone. And so when we are just defaulting to the habits that we've been swooped into. We just have to recognize we're living in the attention economy, which is to say our attention is the commodity that's being competed for these days. And it's by very smart companies. They've done their homework. They know their neuroscience. They know their behavioral psychology. They understand that if there's no natural stopping point, we will scroll endlessly. We will never say to ourselves, look at that. I got to the end of TikTok. Now let me go to bed at a wholesome hour. And they know that if they prey on our fear response or instill uncertainty, doubt, controversy, we're going to stay glued, we'll rubberneck, we will give over an increasingly large share of our attention, they will get more clicks and more ad revenue, but our mental health is the collateral damage. So we just have to make conscious choices as we navigate the information landscape. And it's easier said than done. We can think about who gets to tell us what what and when and how often and start to maybe batch our news check-ins so it's not just a 24 hour a day IV drip of the 24 hour news cycle. And I think that the phone out of the bedroom at night is one of the easiest set it and forget it steps to limiting the way the phone can impact our mental health. When we keep our phone on our bedside table or like clutched to our chests while we sleep, it's the last thing we look at before bed. It sends a shot of blue spectrum light into our eyes, telling our super chiasmatic nucleus or that internal clock in our brain, good morning, the sun is rising, which is not such a bad thing at seven in the morning. It is not a great thing in the middle of the night. And so it's confusing our circadian rhythm and suppressing our melatonin, making it hard to sleep. And it also, you know, our, at least in the United States right now, we have a national pastime of doom scrolling. And what does doom scrolling mean? I, I read this, I thought, I'm obviously out of touch. What is doom scrolling? Well, if you think about when we're in these moments where there's really heavy duty things going on on the global landscape, we are, it, it's a natural part of the human stress response. We wanna be informed, we wanna be aware so that we can anticipate potential negative consequences so we can be prepared. And Part of how we do that these days is endlessly scrolling on social media. And of course, the algorithms are very good at knowing where we dwell, where our eyes spend more time, it gives us more of that. And so it's this reinforcing loop where when we dwell on the things that are really heavy and disconcerting, it will give us more of that. And we stay glued because it keeps putting us in this ginned up stress response. And we just think, I need more, I need more, I need to stay even more informed. This is even worse than I thought. And I'm not here to say things are honky dory in the world. They certainly are not. Um, but I think we want to stay informed and be a part of the conversation in the daytime hours. And right before bed, I really like the line from Brittany Packnett Cunningham. She says, we need rested warriors. It's not to say go live under a rock. It's to say for us to surrender and to sleep, we need to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And scrolling on our phone is not a good recipe for that. So keeping the phone out of the bedroom is protective of our sleep quality, our circadian rhythm, and it makes our bedroom a little bit more of a sanctuary. And I think that if you can pilot it and just set up your charger somewhere else in your home, you can set up your setting so that if you know if a call from a favorite or a double call in the event of an emergency, you'll still hear it, but it's not in arm's reach where you're going to reach for it all through the night. And it's a really good way to protect your sleep. And if you really hate it, you can go back to keeping your phone clutched to your chest. But <laughs> oftentimes it seems difficult to do. And then when you do it, you don't look back. Let's go back to food then. Let's, let's yeah. go back to that. Because you spend a lot of time talking about it. Tell us the, the things which you, which you talk with your patients most about. Yeah. So 
I basically end up taking the opposite stance of wherever my patient is currently at, if I'm being honest with myself. And that's a big part of what I wanted to convey in my chapter about food. The central thesis here is what we eat matters to our mental health. Um, for some people, that's kind of just an obvious given. For others, it's like an irritating idea of the toxic wellness world, and it's like, ugh, I'll eat whatever I want. Um, but I think that we just need to recognize the brain is a physical piece of flesh, like any other organ in the body. It requires certain raw materials to function. And we get those raw materials, those vitamins and minerals from the food we eat. And so every bite we take, that's our opportunity to play at this scavenger hunt of whether we're checking those boxes. And it's hard to do under the best of circumstances and increasingly difficult when we're eating nutritionally bankrupt processed foods. It's not to shame those foods. I'm just here to help people make choices that are self-loving and nourishing. And I think the whole relationship we have to food, it is so fraught these days. And so for some of my patients, I find I need to help them recognize that the way they're feeding themselves is either creating inflammation or creating micronutrient deficiencies and contributing to their mental health issues. For other patients, they've taken my advice and run with it too far. And then we're dealing with more of a state of what's called orthorexia or sort of this obsessive fixation on eating in the right way. And that's not helping anybody's anxiety. So if you're eating in a way that's kind of as a person I was recently talking to on a podcast, she said, I eat like a teenager. If that's what your relationship to food is right now, see if you can come towards a place where from a place of radical self-love, you're nourishing yourself. But if it's become an obsession, if you're obsessively meal prepping, if you're declining social connection to control what you're feeding yourself, I think it's gone too far and it's become counter-therapeutic. And that's where we need to loosen our grip, remind ourselves our bodies are not that fragile and reclaim a connection to pleasure and ease around our food. Mm. So you, you make a nice point in passing where you say, I'm paraphrasing, but one socially relaxed meal in company is going to do you a lot more good than 20 carefully worked out, you know, cleanly eaten, organically sourced meals. And I thought, yeah, that is the natural way of eating. Eating is about is a social thing, or it used to be anyway. I mean, all of this fraught conversation around food, it would be moot if we lived on what I jokingly call Whole30 Island. If what was available to us was paleo template, real foods grown in healthy soil, animals raised with ethical animal husbandry practices, if what was available was good, nourishing, real food, we wouldn't have to overthink this at all. Then social eating would be real food, eating at home would be real food, grabbing something quick on the go would be real food. But it's not the landscape that we live in. So instead we need to find a balance. And at least for me, I think of it as like when I'm at home, when it's easy, I eat homemade food. That's never easy actually, it's still always a lot of work and I have a lot of tools and strategies for how to make it more realistic. But whenever we have an opportunity to share a meal with people that we love, even if it means breaking all of the Dr. Vora rules, I do think that that community and connection trumps every other recommendation in the book. At the very end of the day, it's hardwired in our DNA. We feel safe when we are grounded and held in community. This pertains to the fact that on this proverbial savanna of evolution, human beings, we were never the fastest. We were not the strongest. We were just the ones that figured out how to cooperate. And for this reason, when we feel connected in community, we feel safe. And when we feel on the outskirts, ostracized for one reason, or just socially isolated in our flat or in our like, mansion, we feel unsafe in a subtle, unconscious way. So we always want to prioritize community and connection. Now, you, you also talk about how the you can't get rid of anxiety altogether. Um, and a lot of it you talk about, you need to discharge the stress. You, you, you make quite a lot of the danger that comes from, there are just things in modern life which will make you stressed. You can't, you can't you know, just pull the covers over and, bed and stay in bed 24 hours a day so that you don't get stressed. And it, a lot of what you talk about are the, the, the 
the useful practical strategies for how you discharge the stress that is going to impinge on your life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's inevitable stress in modern life. There was inevitable stress in ancient life. There's, that is just existing on this earth. There is inevitable stress. And so much of the book is devoted toward obviating unnecessary stressors. And then we reconcile with the fact that some stress is inevitable. So what do we do with that stress? And I take a two-part approach to that. One is that we need a way of discharging that stress. And if you look to the animal kingdom, what you'll see is when you know, an animal of prey has a life or death acute stressor, say they drop into a freeze response. When they come to, they, have, uh, they shake. That's their way of discharging excess adrenaline. And it seems to be a way that they tell their nervous system the threat has passed and now it's safe to be in my body again. And as socialized human creatures, we have no shortage of the stressors, but we do not have a practice for shaking every time we get a stressful email from our boss or we trip on a staircase. And so I encourage people to find some way on a daily basis to shake off the stressors that we accumulate. And it can look a lot of different ways. Some people like to exercise vigorously. Some people like to chant or sing or journal or make art. Um, you can have a belly laugh, you can have an ugly cry, you can cuddle with somebody or play with a pet or a baby. Um, I personally like to shake. And that's my approach. I find it to be very efficient and helpful. So it's so hippy dippy and weird, but I put on shamanic drum music. And I shake for about 90 seconds, I do this in between patients to kind of clear. And it just goes right to the core, it presses control alt delete on any stress response. And it seems to excavate what I keep buried. It excavates stuck emotions that are sort of buried in my connective tissues. And then I can be with that and stay curious about it and, and often learn from it. And as you say, it, it does have a biochemical basis. It, it, it does actually flush out the, um, the, the stress chemicals, which otherwise are just sort of circling around saying well any second now that the lion's going to jump out no one's told me the lion's gone away it's probably still there we, just, we need to be alert <laughs> and what you're saying is you've got to get rid of that signal that's right and then the second way of handling the fact that stress is inevitable is to have some daily practice that helps put your body into a relaxation response and the way i think about this it's like a daily multivitamin that you can take that just puts your nervous system spending a little more time every day in a state of relaxation rather than a state of stress. And I think of it as a threshold effect. Like if we have a threshold and if we tip over it into the stress zone, we're more likely to have a panic attack. We're more likely to feel on edge and that urgent, uncomfortable feeling of fearing the future. And the more relaxation response we put our body in, whether it's through a breathing exercise, meditation, yoga nidra, um, we're basically lowering that threshold or in certain ways raising the threshold to go into the stress territory. And so that's a nice practice. It, it's not something I recommend to do at the point of no return. Like you're in a panic attack and it's like, oh, just do a breathing exercise. Doesn't always work, can, can often be counter therapeutic, but to do it prophylactically a little bit every day can help a lot. Mm. Talking of um, panic attacks, you, there's quite a striking bit in the book where you say you in some ways are better to go with it rather than, and this is something that's come up with various authors in, in, in various parts of a broader discussion about mental health, a, a sort of a, a saying various people have said in various ways, as you have, rather than smother them or deny them or try to stuff a pillow over the, this, this, this loud voice, which is telling you that you're not happy, you have to, in some ways, um, ride it out. That's quite yeah. a brave thing to tell someone. Yeah, and, and nobody with anxiety likes hearing that message, but it is what works. And so there's something about anxiety and panic. It's, it's almost somewhat belligerent. And the more we try to strong arm and be rigid with it, it doubles down. And when we surrender to it and drop the resistance and roll with it, it reveals itself to be this discrete process that comes to a climax and resolves on its own. And I find that the more we can actually in basically not try to run from it, but to say, okay, this is happening, I'm diving in. 
And I really encourage my patients to become like an investigative, like a scientist about it, rather than, oh God, oh God, oh God, this is this feeling. I do not like this feeling. It's exquisitely uncomfortable. I feel like I'm going to die or go crazy or lose my mind um, to instead say, okay, this is a panic attack. I know what this is. This is my body working, not dying, but working. This is me in a stress response. My heart is pumping more strongly, more rapidly. My palms are sweating. This is my body in a stress response. And the more we can see it in that dispassioned way and to kind of understand the physiologic, um, how things are playing out, it does take out some of the charge. Mm -hmm. And the more we can surrender into it, anxiety fights us less. And it doesn't need to double down. It just comes to a climax inevitably and resolves. And you also say, uh, which made it it's, it's what I was saying about the common sense tone of the book. You said, look, one of the worst things about a panic attack is that when it starts, you start panicking about the fact that you're going to have a panic attack. You go, you're panicking about the panic. And, and in a way, what you didn't say is, but it was clear is, there's there's enough panic without you adding to it just just <laughs> just be happy with the panic that's happening don't try and don't try and augment it with your panic about the panic i i do this all with the utmost sympathy i also have a brain that spins and overthinks and spirals and so i've learned firsthand here's the thing our brains are meaning makers that's what they're here to be if you give us a piece of paper that has two dots and a line, our brain is like, I know what that is. That's a face. And if you give us the physical sensations of um, you know, a stress response, if we are sleep deprived and over caffeinated and underfed and our body is in a variety of different stress responses, our brain swoops in with a narrative to make sense of the physical sensation. It tells us, oh God, you know what? I'm feeling anxious because of things at work or things in my relationship or things with the state of the world. Um, or it says, oh God, I'm having a panic attack. This is going to be terrible. I'm never going to escape this sensation. Like I'm really stuck. And the more we can just step one foot to the side and look at our brain and say, oh, I see what you're doing. It is actually really helpful. It takes away some of the power of those stories that we tell ourselves. And it clears a path for us to say, I think I know physiologically what's underlying this stress response. In the book, I create this false mood inventory, which I find to be like, I want people to cut it out of the book and put it on the refrigerator. Because when we're in the throes of peak anxiety, we never have the presence of mind to think, am I actually just hungry? Am I sleep deprived? But it's helpful to have something to cue those questions and tell us, yes, you're feeling super anxious. I almost wish that the inventory said like, I'm sorry, you're feeling this way. Validation, validation. Now let's ask the question. Um, is it possible you didn't get good sleep last night? Is it possible you had an extra cup of coffee today? Is it possible something is going awry with your digestion? Um, and a number of other potential causes, just so we can go through that inventory and think, oh, there is a physical basis for how I'm feeling right now. And it really softens the blow and it gives us a strategy for how to be less anxious. We can carry on talking about that forever because um, there's a lot more in the book, um, but we need to move on to true anxiety because again, you, you have your own take on that. As you say, this is your body being used as, the, as a sort of a loud hailer for you. It, it's, 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 the, it's got its own language for saying something deep and true is amiss in your life and you're not doing anything about it. So, I'm going to use the stomach to make sure you can't ignore this any longer. And as you say, it's, it's a lovely little bit, which I, I can't find to quote back to you. Um, but as you say, true, true anxiety starts as a whisper from your body. But if you just steadfastly ignore it, eventually it will raise its voice until you just have to listen. I thought, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So tell us, tell us more about what you mean because this is the, the, the other kind of anxiety. I like that you bring up that the body uses the stomach. There, those neurons are coming in handy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it does start as a whisper. I mean, most of us, if we got really still and quiet right now, we could tune in and we could hear some whisper from our, our internal compass. And it's telling us, you know, there's this really inconvenient truth about your life and you know it. You like to pretend you don't know it, but you know it. 
and it feels like you would blow up your life to make good on that. Um, and so we, most of us resist it. But sometimes it does have a way of saying, I, this, I will not let this continue. Um, I think about people who hate their job and eventually just cannot get out of bed or are not in the right relationship and eventually their body really shuts down if they're about to be intimate, for example. So our body has a way of coming to a shout, but it behooves us to start listening when it's more at the whisper stage. And here's the thing, it sounds very weighty and lofty and daunting, but I do think that the body, our internal knowing, it recognizes that we are here with a unique perspective and a unique contribution to make. That's my personal worldview. I don't need everyone to be married to that worldview, but I find it to be true in my practice. And it's just here to nudge us and say, no pressure, but you know you're not totally on your path of carrying out that contribution. And can you just be at least moving in the direction of getting to that point? And I really think so many of us need to rehabilitate our relationship to pressure, expectations, perfectionism. We, we carry so much conditioning and fear around, oh God, like, but what if I fail? But what if I'm not good enough? And I want to really take all of that weightiness away from this. Our contribution doesn't have to be lofty. It doesn't have to be grand. It certainly doesn't have to be perfect. We just need to be recognizing that our unique perspective and our gifts, what light us up, it's not an accident and we have something to offer and we feel better when we are making that manifest. It kind of pertains to the idea of how we're all really artists and we need to create something and it doesn't have to be what other people even like. It just has to be our truth made manifest in the world. And so I think with true anxiety, it more, more than anything, it just requires that we slow down and get still and listen and then trust that voice. And that can be really difficult. Yes. I mean, it's as if your body is saying to you, look, you may be able to lie to yourself, but you're not going to lie to me, matey. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and a, a point which um, hasn't come up in, in other books that I've read in this area, but you do very strongly, and I thought, ah, this is really good. Lots of books point out that um, the, the rates of, stress and anxiety and depression is much higher among women than it is among men. And they all just say this and then move on. And you go, right, well, that's terrible. And on we go. But what you just said about true anxiety, that you're not being true to yourself, that you're letting the world say, look, you, you need to be like this, or th that that's much more the way that women have traditionally been brought up the point you make that women traditionally are to are expected more than men perhaps to to put other people's feelings first and to to make the compromises and i thought oh, okay for the first time someone's actually pointing to something of why it's much more prevalent amongst women and and you you make quite a bit of it in the book in a really helpful way and you also talk about the, the, the biology of um, periods and menopause, which again, I thought that's really interesting. Yeah. Do we have an hour? Let's talk about this. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> in we two, don't in have two an minutes hour. or less. <laughs> so, I, think, I think that there is a lot of conditioning that women are under. And um, <laughs> I mean, the world <laughs> works on the backs of women saying yes and betraying our own needs, our own needs in order to be at service of others. And I think that. I really think about the Taoist idea of the yin yang, that th these two facets, the yang principle, that masculine sun doing productivity energy lives in perfect balance, dynamic equilibrium, but balance with the feminine aspect of rest, receptivity, intuition, non-doing. And our culture is obsessed with yang. That's what we value. And we devalue the yin. In fact, when you catch anybody valuing yin, if you look underneath the surface, it's always in service of yang. We say, oh, I want to meditate so that I can be more productive at work. And so it's really just more, you know, it's, it's more yang and yin's clothing. And I think that we actually, as a culture, all of us need to start to value rest and value more feminine principles and then fiercely and unapologetically protect them. Mm -hmm. And I think in my own life, earlier on, 
I perceived that this is a world that celebrates the masculine, that celebrates objective reasoning, rationality, um, not being sensitive or emotional or irrational. So I thought, well, I want to be seen as intelligent. I want to be accepted in the boys club. So I too will be objective and rational. And it took me until my mid thirties to realize that I was silencing an enormous part of how I can navigate the decisions in my life, which is using intuition. Mm. And um, and it was a rocky learning curve for me to actually start to honor that voice and to not be embarrassed or ashamed of the fact that I have a not completely rational or objective way of perceiving reality and navigating decisions. Hmm. And now I just fully embrace it. And it's not yes, that it, I've discarded the objective. Yeah. And you, you make that point when you talk um, about um, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which of course yeah. is terribly popular. Um, and you make the point that the, the problem with it is it, it, it part of its teaching is to be skeptical about emotions. You, should, you shouldn't trust those, you should step back. And there's a lovely sentence on page 210. Feelings aren't facts, but they're not histor hysterical falsehoods either. They are a form of truth. I thought that was a great sentence. Um, yeah. And yeah. It packs a lot of truth in it. Yeah, I mean, I picked down a bunch of sacred cows, you know, from body positivity and veganism to psych meds, but CBT, I imagine I'm going to get some pushback on this. Yeah. I value the principles of CBT. I use them in my practice. I, I use plant-based diets and psych meds in my practice as well, and the principles of body positivity. But I think all of these are overdue for a more nuanced both and conversation. And when it comes to CBT, those principles can be so impactful and helpful and they can really deny somebody their hard won sense of reality. And, and I think that when somebody is saying, well, I was in a social situation and I perceived that somebody didn't like me there, CBT will tell you, well, you know, that's, you're, you're jumping to all these conclusions, you're mind reading, you don't know this. And that's fair. We don't factually know this. But maybe as humans, we have this sort of superhuman capacity for picking up on social cues. We're very sophisticated social animals. And I'm not in the business of denying when my patient has a hunch like that. We're always going to balance it with objective reasoning, but we're not going to deny it. And I think that sometimes CBT can be a little bit, um, to me, there's a little bit of a subtle misogyny baked into it, where it says the way that on the margin, a way of thinking that might come more naturally phenotypically to a male brain is somehow better than what might come phenotypically a little bit more naturally on the margin to a female brain. A lot of caveats there, because of course, you know, all of the recognition of this construct of the gender binary, but I tend to see these patterns play out in my patients. Mm -hmm.